Well, this morning we are uh, reconnecting with the book of Acts, and we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 15 together. Uh, It's a little while since we've looked at Acts, and you will remember that the gospel has gone out from uh, Jerusalem. It's gone to Judea, it's gone to Samaria, and then, of course, it's crossed the boundary. It's gone to the Gentiles. And Paul, uh, with Peter in Acts 10, and then Paul and Barnabas have been sent out from Antioch to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. They've gone to Cyprus, they've gone to modern-day Turkey, and then they've come back down to Antioch. And we pick up the action in chapter 15, and let me read that to you. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and the elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, And as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders to whom they reported everything everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we or our ancestors have been able to bear? No, We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this. As it is written, after this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. That the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things. Things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Let's pray as we come to this word. Father, we thank you that you are our loving God, that you are rich in mercy. We thank you for all that we have in Christ. Please use your word now to refresh us in the gospel. Please use this word to protect us in the gospel and to build us up in the Lord Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, of all the passages in Scripture that we could be looking at this morning as we live through COVID, you might be asking, is Acts chapter 15 the best? Well, I hope you really will find uh, this chapter to be a blessing. You see, we can't at the moment meet properly. We can meet like this, but we can't talk very much, can we? And there on our own, we may be facing real difficulties In isolation, we may be experiencing great doubts. 
Maybe even asking a question, have I really been accepted by God? You know, often when we're stretched and anxious, we see our sin more clearly, we are more aware of our faults and the faults of those around us maybe as well. And we ask ourselves, given who I am, given what I've done, has God really accepted me? Am I really clean in his sight? That inner voice convicting us, telling us we're not worthy. Well, I hope that Acts 15 will be a real help for us. This chapter describes for us what is usually called the Council of Jerusalem. Well, what is the Council of Jerusalem? What is it all about? Who was there? Why is it important? Well, the chapter starts, 15, chapter 15 starts in Antioch, that city which is about 200, 300 miles north of Jerusalem, where there's a large Gentile church, where it's Jew and Gentile, but many Gentiles. God has been powerfully working in Antioch, and as we've already mentioned, from Antioch, Paul and Barnabas were sent out on their missionary journey into Gentile country. They're now back in Antioch, but the peace in Antioch has been disturbed. Some folk have come down from Judea, from Israel, with a very clear message for the Christians in Antioch. You Christians, you believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to obey the law of Moses. You need to be circumcised. You need to do this, it's very clear, in order to be saved. If you really want salvation, yes, you believe in Christ, you need to obey the law and you need to be circumcised. By the way, I think we've got to feel the power of their arguments. These were Jewish believers in Jesus. They thought they were being faithful. They'd read the scriptures. All the descendants of Abraham were to be circumcised. To be accepted by God, you had to obey the law. It's very simple, very powerful, very compelling. Paul and Barnabas they were having none of it. They argued with them, and the church in Antioch sent Paul and Barnabas up to Jerusalem to deal with the problem at source. To look to sort the issue out with the church in Jerusalem. So Paul and Barnabas, with a handful of others, made the 300-mile journey. And as they made their way up to Jerusalem, we read that they stopped and spent time with Jewish Christians. Uh, I assume having hospitality. They were going to do it stage by stage, of course. And there, as they go down through Judea, through all of that Samaria, they speak about what God has been doing amongst the Gentiles. And people are just thrilled to hear it. Well, they get to Jerusalem. They are welcome. The whole church was delighted to see them. The apostles and the elders in the church are delighted to see them. And I sense there must have been a massive church meeting. Just imagine hundreds and hundreds of people doing all those things that we used to do, gathering, being there. And Paul and Barnabas do their PowerPoint projections, presentation or whatever they did, showed the map of where they'd been, told the stories of conversions of Jews and the conversions of lots of Gentiles in Cyprus, in Pisidian Antioch, in Iconium, in Lystra. And maybe at some point in that meeting, they went, you know, any questions? And some stand up. Believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees The Gentiles, verse 5, must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. How are we clear on that, they're saying? They must be circumcised, these people who are turning to faith in Christ, and obey the law of Moses. Well, the apostles and the elders meet to discuss this issue. I think in some ways the whole church is in on this, and we'll see at the end of the the kind of section, the apostles, the elders, get together to work this through. And as we move through this chapter, we see there's a lot of discussion, 
And then there are three speeches. The first is from Peter. The second is from Paul and Barnabas. And the third is from a senior leader from the Jerusalem church, James himself. Three speeches, I think, establishing three key points as we listen into these speeches. They things will be very familiar to you, but they are vitally important. What do they establish here in these speeches as they address this council and as they come to their decision? Well, the first is great news for us at Spicer Street. God is in the business of saving Gentiles. You see, how does Peter's speech start? Peter grew up and addressed in verse 7. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice between you uh, that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Peter's saying it was God's initiative that I would take the gospel to the Gentiles and that God would purify their heart by faith. It was God's plan to take the gospel to the Gentiles. The second speech is from Paul and Barnabas. Luke doesn't actually tell us what they said because we know what Paul and Barnabas are going to say. They're going to tell us what we've already read about in Acts, the way that God used them amongst the Gentiles. And Paul and Barnabas simply recount how God has worked and did signs and wonders. What point is is he making? Well, God is blessing the Gentile mission. God is for, in the business of saving Gentiles. What point does Jesus make, uh, does James, sorry, make in his speech? Well, verses 14 and 15. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. We can see that God is choosing a people from the Gentiles, says James. The words, verse 15, of the prophets are in agreement with this. In other words, this is what the Bible foretold. This is what the Scriptures foretold. The Pharisee party are claiming the Scriptures as their guide. They must be circumcised. But hang on, says James. God is building his tent through his uh, descendant of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Gentiles, the Scriptures of the Gentiles, would be called in. Verse 17, that quoting Amos, the rest of mankind may see the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name. God is in the business of saving the Gentiles. And this, the Jerusalem church is having to see and to really grasp. God is in the business of saving the Gentiles. He was going to have Gentiles who bore his name. And he wasn't going to have Gentiles who became Jews. He's actually going to have Gentiles. He's going to save Gentile Gentiles bringing them to his house. This is great news, is it not? And I hope we never tire of reflecting on this as we come uh, into the book of Acts and as we go through the book of Acts. Let me just use the vaccine as an illustration. I'm not making any great point about the medical ethics or uh, or the medical science of the vaccine. I just want to use it as an illustration. Just imagine that just one country had bothered with making a vaccine, say Germany, that it had invested in the technology, had set aside the scientists, had worked really hard, while every other country had done nothing. And they had developed a vaccine, a completely safe, 100% ethical vaccine. And no one else had bothered. And Germans have said, sorry, this vaccine is for Germans only. Oh, we'd like some here in Britain. I'm sorry, you've been too long being rude to us. You're not getting any. The Russians will have some. I'm sorry, we've had too many wars with you. The Americans, no, we're fed up with you. We're just going to have our vaccine for us. They'd be perfectly in their rights to do that, wouldn't they? They don't owe it to anyone. They've made it. It's theirs. But imagine they actually went, well, actually, we're preparing 
8 billion doses to make it freely available to the world. You see, the gospel says, not from COVID, but from judgment. It brings us in the right relationship with God. And God could have just given it to Israel. But God made it and chose to make it free to the whole world. Given us the gospel, given us salvation. It is amazing. And I wonder whether the Pharisee party actually slightly resented the gospel going to others. Well, the Council of Jerusalem is affirming and seeing that God really was in the business of saving Gentiles, saving the nations. Secondly, the Council of Jerusalem recognizes that Jews and Gentiles are saved in the same way. That is, through faith in Jesus Christ, not by law. Jews and Gentiles are saved in the same way. You see, what does Peter say in his speech? Let me pick it up again there in um, verse 8. God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by the giving of the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. As Peter preached the gospel to Cornelius back in Acts 10, God accepted the Gentiles into his family right there and then. They believed the gospel. And what was the sign that they were accepted? The Holy Spirit descended upon them. They put their faith in Christ. They were cleansed there and then. They received it as they believed in Christ. Accepted at this point. And they were cleansed. So Peter goes on and tackles the issue of law. And he makes this really strong statement in verse 10. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? They were saved there and then. Why are you now trying to bring them under this law? Why are you testing God? He's really strong, isn't it? This is going to irritate God if you do this. Why put on them a yoke that we haven't been able to bear and our ancestors weren't able to bear? In what sense is the Old Testament, is is, is law, the Mosaic law, a yoke that is unable to bear? Well, I think it's probably referred to in a couple of ways. It's actually just very hard to keep at a practical level, particularly if you live amongst the Gentiles. The food laws, the clothing laws, the Sabbath laws, the keeping of the law with the land and all the sacrifices. It is is a huge amount to it. But more than that, it was a yoke at the level it couldn't save you. It said, obey and be blessed. But because of sin, they couldn't obey. They were weak. And the law just condemns. It's not the first time this has come up in the book of Acts. 13.39, as uh, Paul um, spoke uh, there in, in Pisidian Antioch. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification we're not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Through the law, they could not find salvation. Through the law, they just saw they were sinned. Through the law, it was just such a burden. It was not the way to be right with God. Rather, he says, verse 11, no, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. We weren't saved by law, we were saved by Christ, by his God's gift to us in Christ, which we received just through believing. That's how we were saved, and that's how they're saved. They do not need the law in that sense. You see, the people that come down from Judea in 15.1 saying, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. 
Peter answers it in 15:11. No, we, it is through great, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved, just as they are. Now, of course, that leaves the role of the law for a different day, but it's the point of how we're saved. Let's just allow this to sink in. As Rory said, during this COVID time, you may have become really discouraged, feeling down, a sense of performing badly, of things going wrong, worried about what others think of you. Maybe at home experience new levels of frustration. But what does this tell us? Well, that you have been accepted by God through faith in Christ. You have been saved by grace. Your salvation at first did not depend upon your ability to keep the law. And your salvation now does not rest on your obedience even now. It rests on what Christ has done for you. You have been given the Holy Spirit. You have been cleansed. You have been accepted. The inner Pharisee gets a voice, doesn't he, in our internal counsel. In order to be saved, you must be good. You were cleansed, but in order to stay, you must now be the perfect law keeper. You listen to your inner Pharisee, I must do right in order to be saved, I'm not doing so well. It's going to be crushing. Listen to Peter instead. We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved. Just as we are, just as they are. Through your faith in Christ, you have been cleansed and you have been accepted. You've been granted that new status. Rejoice in it. Enjoy it. Christ has dealt with your sin. Christ has perfectly kept the law for you. Anyone listening who does not yet belong to Jesus, do you know yourself to be a failure and a sinner? Do you want to be cleansed, to receive the Holy Spirit, to be accepted by God? The big mistake is to think we get in with God by trying harder, by trying to keep the rules. You can't save yourself by being good. Look to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, I need a Savior. I look to you. You are the Savior. I put my trust in you. Give me your spirit and give me new life. So firstly, the council recognizes that God is in the business of saving Gentiles. Secondly, we see that the Jews and Gentiles are saved in the same way, by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. And thirdly, and this is more tricky, I think the first two things are all nice and clear, but let me have a go at the third as well here. We see that the council, we see the council seek to maintain unity between the Jewish and Gentile believers. The council has a concern for unity between the Jewish and Gentile believers. You see, what action do the council settle on? Now, we haven't had time to read on for the rest of the chapter, but it is there uh, right at the, uh, in, in verse 20. James concludes this matter, and this is what the church will do, and they'll all agree to do, that we should write to them, write to the Gentiles, uh, and tell them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. Why? For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earlier times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. What is that about? A letter to the Gentiles. Notice verse 19. They are very, very keen not to make things difficult for the Gentiles. In my judgment, therefore, it says we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. The word is actually annoy. We don't want to annoy the Gentiles, put a burden on the Gentiles. In other words, he's saying, well, we're not going to put the law onto them. That's not right. But... We are going to ask them to abstain from these four things. 
Not because the law says so, but we'd like them to do this. These four things, food that has been involved in idol worship, sexual immorality, meats of strangled animals, and a blood, presumably from blood of animals. Why those four things? And in any case, abstaining from sexual immorality is hardly kind of optional extra for Gentile, you know, Gentiles. Whether they're Jew or Gentile believers, they had to abstain from sexual immorality. What is this list about? I'll give you my best guess. I don't think I'm far wrong, though. These three of them are food items. Food that has been offered to idols, the meat of strangled animals, and not, uh, eat, not eating blood. Now, they're not under law, the Gentiles, but we want you to keep some of the food laws. Why? Verse 21, because the law of Moses is taught in every city of the ancient world. I think he's reminding the Gentiles that they must stay away from idolatry, food sacrificed to, to idols. But I think it's about being sensitive to Jews. Sensitive to Jews out there sensitive to Jews in the church and sensitive to Jews they're trying to win for the gospel in the various cities across the world. Sensitive to Jews in the church because if you mess with the food laws, that's going to make it very hard for Jews and Gentiles in the church to eat together. Sensitive to the Jews in the synagogues where the law is being read, they're just going to be grossed out by you Gentile believers if you just eat what you like where you like. Be sensitive, please. We don't want to burden you with the law and annoy you with the law. But can we, at this point, ask you, please, to observe these things? As I say, I don't think sexual immorality is an optional thing there. That will always be binding. It's just saying, beware of what grosses out Jews who believe and Jews who don't believe. I think this is a plea for unity and a plea to be sensitive in reaching others for the gospel. And isn't that a great thing for us to be reflecting on? The principle remains good. We, don't, we are no longer bound, I think, by these food laws. We're no longer in this kind of era where we're trying to win Jews who are in that same sort of way. But it's a principle that's going to come in the New Testament time and time again. We've been saved, we're free, but be careful how we use our freedom for the sake of others, for the sake of unity, and for the sake of the advance of the gospel. And it's just good, isn't it, to remind us at this time that there are things that can divide us. I think particularly Christians in the kind of political area, maybe the whole the Brexit, maybe our approach to COVID, maybe the politics more generally. Be careful how we speak about them, please. To maintain the unity of the church and not actually be speaking about things that the world around us are going to think we're crazy. Making sure we maintain the unity of the church and speaking in a way which honors the gospel. So in summary, the Council of Jerusalem. God really is for us in the sense of sending the gospel to the Gentiles. That is just great news. He did not owe it to us. We have been saved by faith through Christ. Uh, we have been saved by Christ through faith, by grace. His undeserved favor. Rejoice in the salvation you have been accepted. And let's be sensitive. Let's maintain unity. Let's be wise in the way we relate to the outsiders as we start to seek to share the gospel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this counsel. We thank you that this, in one sense, happened and won that the early church could see that the gospel really was for the nations. That they defended justification by faith alone. And we thank you for that gospel. We thank you for the seeds of this kind of thinking about unity. And we thank you for all that flowed from this and as we seek to maintain unity. Take this word, do us good by it, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.